Hi, this is part five in my series on linear viscoelasticity. The focus today is on the storage and the loss modulus. Basically, how does a linear viscoelastic material model behave under a cyclically applied strain history? So why do we care about this? Well, the, we care about this because in many applications, polymer parts are exposed to a cyclic uh, vibration or cyclic load, and it's important to understand how it responds to that load. Another reason for this is that it's actually very easy to measure the dynamic response of a material, a polymer, using a dynamic mechanical analysis, a DMA machine. That can measure directly the storage and the loss modules for you. So it's good to understand what these values mean and how you can use it to calibrate a material model. And that's what I want to talk about here today. So let's talk about this uh, from first principles, as we have done in my series here. Uh, so the strain I will focus on is a strain that depends on time. It says an amplitude and a frequency like this. And I'm only considering times that are greater than zero. And from earlier, I have showed that the stress response from any strain history can be calculated from this equation. So if you take the time derivative of the strain, we will end up with some equation that we can plug in. And, and this is what it looks like. So at the bottom here, we have the stress versus time, relaxation modulus, and then we have the cosine, which is the, comes out of the time derivative of the strain history. For, for simplicity, I will then actually change the variables, We're integrating over d tau here, but I'm going to change that so we integrate over ds, and the s is t minus tau. So I will switch the variable and uh, basically plug in these substitutions here, and this is the equation that will be valid for any history for any vis linear viscoelastic material model. Uh, when your strain is a sinusoidal function. And this is what we will use in, in these examples. Uh, but it's a little bit abstract still, right? This is a, a kind of a complicated equation from previous page. Here's the strain history. To make it more concrete, what I want to do is I'm going to use a specific stress relaxation modulus, a prony series term here of this kind. So it's an initial modulus value of E0 and an exponentially decaying value uh, of time as shown here. So I plug this into this equation and if you do a bunch of math on this you will see that the stress will be given by this equation in the end. So it's not a lot of complicated math but it's a little tedious so uh, I'm not going to show you all the steps that I did to come to this conclusion. We'll see the stress is now a function of a constant here that depends on frequency and then it's a cosine term and a sine term. And then there's another factor here that is an exponentially decaying factor. This is the transient solution that will go away. And uh, this is a term that is important at short terms, but if longer time it's steady state, it will totally go away. So the stress will be uh, proportional to cosine term and the sine term. So to look at this decaying function a little bit, we can use M calibration. So here's the window M calibration. I have set a ANSYS linear elastic prony series with one term. And here are the Young's modulus and the relaxation moduli. And I set, basically created a sinusoidal strain history like this. And it's going to simulate this. And if you click on that, this is what it would look like. So the stress goes around like that. And in M calibration, we can plot this as a function of time if you want. So we can see what it looks like. Initially it goes up and then it goes down. And then in the second cycle, you will see that it, it actually starts to catch up into a steady state response with these particular parameters. And that's exactly what we would expect uh, in this term with the exponentially decaying response that we just showed. So now it's a steady state response. You can't really see the curve anymore. So that's how that would work. And here again, it's the full solution that we just calculated. And this is the equation that derived in many cases, this is not what you care about. You do care about the steady state response, not the full solution that contains this initial response as well. And it turns out you can convert from the full solution to the steady state solution by integrating it to infinite times. Then the decaying functions will go away and you get the, the results that you're looking at. And um, we can do this uh, in steady state as follows. This is the equation from the previous page. And we can simplify it a little bit now because it's a cosine of one value minus another value. So we can expand it to cosine, cosine, sine, sine, as you may remember. And if you expand it this way, what's really interesting, this is the main equation that people have seen uh, many times probably, that the stress is proportional to a value of sine times a storage modulus times plus a cosine term and a loss modulus. 
And this is the definition of the loss modulus, this is the definition of the storage modulus, which will be dependent on the frequency itself. So that's how linear viscoelasticity would respond in steady state under cyclic load. And that's summarized at the bottom here with the storage and the loss module. And those are the terms that the DMA test machine will provide to you. And final thing I just want to mention is sometimes people talk about tan delta. What is tan delta? Well, we know now that uh, the stress under these conditions has a sine and a cosine term. You can also write that as sine with a, a t with a, this omega t plus a phase angle delta. And you can expand this again since it is alpha plus beta. Basically, you expand it out in this form. And then you can figure out very quickly that tan delta, this delta phase angle, is given by uh, this loss modulus divided by the storage modulus. And there are many other little equations that one can derive based on all of this, but I don't think those are as important as the ones I talked about here. If you want to see a little bit more about the theory here, check out my book. To summarize, the storage and loss models are very easy to, to measure, and that's why people like them. They give you a lot of information about the viscoelastic response, and then you can calibrate the prony series terms using, for example, M calibration from the dynamic data. And that's why this is an important topic. And uh, now you know a little bit where these equations come from. If you have any questions, you can ask them below.